Good afternoon. I'm Vera Flom, the moderator from the League of Women Voters of San Diego. And I want to welcome you to the candidate forum for District 2 City Council uh, for the city of Chula Vista. Uh, this uh, meeting is co-sponsored by the Southwest Chula Vista Civic Association and Crossroads Roads 2. Um, we have three of the five candidates here at the moment, um, and that's Steve Stenberg, and you want to raise your hand, Steve? Oh, sure. Yeah. Steve okay. Stenberg. And uh, Patty Grew. Grew. Okay. And uh, we have Jose. Preciado. Uh oh, I don't speak Spanish. First, Preciado. Preciado. Okay. All right, we got it. Um, and uh, the other two have medical issues. Uh, Fran Francie may show up, and John has, he's in the hospital, so he's provided an opening statement that I will read. Um, the candidates have chosen their order of opening and closing statements, so they will go in this order. Um, and uh, the league moderates candidate forums around the area. Um, we try to make them fair and informative. We have question screeners in the back, uh, Kate Palmer and um, Donna Bartlett May, and Teresa Acero is from um, one of the host organizations. Um, so the views uh, expressed here today are not those of the co-sponsors, they're those of the candidates. The questions need to be not personal and pertaining to the office of Council District 2. Um, a leak website is available in case you were unable to come today or you want to see it again. Um, so you go to https slash slash dot And if you go to uh, events, there's a whole selection of event videos. And this will be on the website by tomorrow. Um, the league is nonpartisan, and so we do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Uh, KPBS is co-sponsoring what we call Voters Edge with us. This is a website, votersedge.org. There are bookmarks in the back, out in the hall, about that. Um, and if you put in your street address, it'll pull up your ballot, and then there's a lot of background information about the people you're voting for. And in another election, they would include uh, ballot measure background. But we have no ballot measures. Uh, in San Diego, do you have ballot measures in Chula Vista? Mm -hmm. Oh, you do? Okay, well, they'll be on there. Um, and uh, so it, it's a very helpful thing. Um, way to vote uh, with more information. Um, let's see, the candidates have two minutes for their opening statements and their closing statements, and one minute to answer the questions, and we'll try and um, jiggle the order. Um, so with no further comments, I want to um, welcome Steve, to start with your opening statement. All right. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming today. I know it's uh, warm outside, but it's real comfortable in here. Uh, my name is Steve Stenberg. I'm running for a candidate for Chula Vista Council District 2. I'm a lifelong member of the community. I graduated from Bindi Vista High School, and I went on to Southwestern College. I then served my country in the Air Force. I got out of the Air Force. I joined the U.S. Customs Service for a couple of years. And then from there, I was currently with California as fire as a defensible space inspector is what I do now. 
My wife Melinda is here. I also raised our boys here. They both went to Hilltop High School. And now I've got three little small Chula Vistas that hopefully we'll send to high school in 10 or 11 years. Our family opened a small business here in Chula Vista in the historical downtown area. They needed jobs and businesses and we did a good job. The mayor gave us an award for neighborhood revitalization. While other small businesses during the pandemic were closing down, employees were being laid off, we managed to save our business and we hired back all of our employees when the pandemic opened up. Uh, along with that, my wife and I recently sold the business to my son and daughter-in-law and the business is thriving. Right out of college, I joined the Air Force. My background is public service. I just celebrated 44 years in December of public service time. I've uh, been in both law enforcement and fire department. Uh, I retired from Federal Fire Department San Diego in 2009, and I'm on my eighth season working with Cal Fire as a defensible space inspector, where I work in the East County helping houses prep for wildfire. My main job is to go ahead and meet with residents. I go ahead and educate them on the programs available, similar to like we have programs here that'll help them pay for the work that needs to be done to get ready for a wildfire. My father was a public servant. He was both an assistant city manager and a city manager. And with that, I come from a long line of educators, my grandmother, my mother, my wife, and most of my relatives on the one side of my family are educators. As your representative of Chula Vista, I will re represent you, the people of Chula Vista, no interest. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, Patty, go ahead. Hello, my name is Patty Grew. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in New Jersey where I attended Rutgers University and the Rutgers School of Library and Information Studies. So early on in high school and in college, I did pretty much everything you can imagine in, in libraries. Um, in the mid 80s, I moved to San Diego and pretty soon after <clears throat> I uh, settled in Chula Vista. Um, after, I, after a little while, I got married and I was away for a couple years, but when my husband and I were looking for a place to live and raise our family, I said, it's gotta be Chula Vista. Uh, we have um, always enjoyed going to the street fairs, the Living Coast Discovery Center. My daughter and I used to practically live there every weekend, going to the Olympic Training Center. And we just absolutely love the feel and, and the hometown feel of uh, Chula Vista. Um, I ended up going and getting a job with the County of San Diego Health and Human Service Agency in 1988, and I worked in eligibility evaluations for government services, monitoring government contracts, strategic planning, legislative analysis, and I worked in homeless outreach, as well as the last 20 years I did government financial management and analysis. I look to retire, uh, a in March, after 34 years of service to the county of San Diego. And I heard about this opportunity and I thought, I have all these skills, and I thought, how could I use them to help my adopted hometown of Chula Vista? And so I decided to run for, uh, for city council. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jose, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanna first thank my colleagues up here on the stage. I appreciate very much our willingness to participate in this process and be present in the community. My name is, uh, again, my name is Jose Preciado. I've been uh, a public servant my entire career since I reached adulthood. Um, I have been employed with San Diego State University for the past 24 years where I have served as a student services professional. And my, I have been fortunate that most of my career has centered on providing college opportunity for people who live in the South Bay, especially through the Compact for Success, a partnership between San Diego State University and the Sweetwater Union High School District. Most recently, we're about to enroll another 600 students from our local high schools with guaranteed admission. In addition to that kind of activity, I have been also the elected representative of this community offering safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water. I serve as your elected representative on the Sweetwater Authority. I've been doing so since 2008. I've been reelected three times, and I ran unopposed in the last election. 
One of the striking things about my experience here in the South Bay, I grew up, I went to Nestor Elementary, Southwest Junior, Southwest High. I, I then attended San Diego State. Uh, but since, I, since my early 20s, I've been involved civically here in the, in the greater South Bay, and specifically in this room, I, I dare say, I've hosted forums of candidates like today, and uh, it's interesting that today, I, the juxtaposition of where I sit now and, and participate. Thank you very much. I look forward to responding to the questions. Okay, thank you all. Now here's a statement from John Borgia. I'm currently addressing a health procedure in the hospital, but I will shortly be discharged and ready to be your councilman for District 2. I sincerely wish I could be present to meet and greet my friends, family, and community stakeholders today. I'm a retired educator in our community, and I want to work with our fellow leaders to advance our growing city in these areas. One, improving our public transportation for our student population and our growing senior population. Two, developing policy on affordable housing for students and seniors in our community. Three, having serious conversations with local stakeholders and discussing smart methods on how to ease traffic congestion in our district. Four, we need to grow and support our small businesses in Chula Vista. Our small business need our support through grants, policy, and permit process. Five, develop smart strategies for preferred light, lighting in our community so we have a more safe pedestrian environment for our citizens to walk at night and feel safe. I look forward to meeting all of you in the coming weeks. Um, okay, so Patty, we'll start with you. Uh, what is your position on the tenant protection ordinance which will be on the agenda this Tuesday. Okay, so um, I've just started reading about the tenant protection ordinance, so I, I, I gotta admit, I don't have a lot of the details on that. Um, I, I do know that with that kind of thing, we really need to look at it as a balance um, between- They can't hear you. Yeah, yeah can't. I gotta be closer to my Okay, every time I move closer, I kind of bump the table. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Could you put so, the mic closer to yourself? Because it's really hard to hear everyone. Does that work? Oh, they're hard wired, so you can only move them three inches. Yeah. Does that? Yeah. But you can bend this thing down and. Yeah. How about that? Can you hear me? Can, we, can you hear me now? Um, so, as I said, um, I'm just starting to look into the information on that. Um, I think we have to look at kind of a balance. Um, we, do, we do have a lot of issues with housing here in Chula Vista. Uh, so I think we have to kind of look at a balance between what the, what the renters need and, and what the landlords mm -hmm. can, can tolerate after having um, two years of, you know, two plus years, I guess, of, of dealing with the pandemic, and also just a lot of issues with not having, a, a, you know, affordable housing and various things going on. So uh, uh, not probably a good answer. I need to look into that a little more. All right, Steve, you wanna answer that, please? Can you give say me that? Say it again? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. What is your position on the tenant protection ordinances which will be on the agenda this Tuesday. You know, the tenant uh, protections are important, especially for the renter. Uh, this day we've seen in the pandemic, uh, we've seen that uh, a lot of uh, renters lost their jobs. Uh, they were on borderline of homeless, but they were able to stay in their house, but they couldn't pay their rent. And then the landlords were upset because they were making house payments and they weren't getting any money in. And so it was a tenuous position to be a renter for a long time. Not to mention we're short in this county on rentals and housing market has skyrocketed as you've seen now. It, it's almost like the 08 raises where now houses are so expensive that even two income family really is hard pressed to buy a house. With that in mind, I know that we need to have protections for renters in place. 
Uh, we had rental property for a while. Uh, our goal was not to raise the rent. That was our deal. We knew they were in trouble. They both had jobs, but we weren't going to gouge them, weren't going to have a problem, force them out. If a renter is having problems, there's public assistance they can have, and we need to really promote those problems, those positions to go ahead and help the renters. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Steve. Jose? So as we all experienced the pandemic, it was harder on some of our families than it was on, on others. And I say that only because it was because of the moratoriums that we were able to keep most people in their homes during the public health emergency. The state of California through, the, through legislation enacted the AB 1482, which is known as the Tenant Protection Act. This, this specific act through the state created uh, some protections for our, our residents. And those are the same protections that are available to all Chula Vistans now who are eligible under that particular program. I think when this uh, initiative started in January, the Housing Commission may have had uh, good public policy in mind, but I think we still need to work together with the industry that provides the housing providers to see what is the best way to protect tenants. Thank you. Okay, Jose, I'm gonna have you start with this one. Okay. Uh, state or comment uh, your thoughts on the city budget in one minute. Um, and have you ever been to a budget meeting? Uh, yes, I have been to budget meetings. In fact, I've been to budget meetings over the last 20 years. I've been involved in uh, civic life here in Chula Vista, and it's been hard. We've had some terrible cycles with significant downturns that have created, well, challenges. This library had to decrease its number of hours in 2008 and 2009, if you all recall. So what's happening now? I think the city council had an opportunity and it took advantage of it to refinance some of the structured uh, debt related to our re retirement benefits of the employees. And they were able to create cost savings that are, uh, that are part of the budget now. One of the things that we will always contend with in this community is the structural imbalance between the number of housing compared to the number of businesses there is a, sh a small deficit, but I think working together, the city council and mayor can resolve that small deficit. We have to increase the number of businesses in this community. Thank you. Oh. And he cuts off right in mid-sentence. Uh, Steve, go ahead. That's why we only have two minutes. <coughs> One, One minute. minute. One minute. We can't finish our sentences. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Can I have the question again, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, what's your uh, comment about the city budget and have you ever attended a budget meeting? I have not attended a budget meeting for here in Chula Vista. I have been in budget when I was in the federal government and also initially in the CAL FIRE. Uh, budget meetings are tense usually, that's the best way to put them. Uh, here in Chula Vista, the budget's going in the right direction. Uh, we have uh, Proposition A and Proposition P that each earn 4.2 million extra on top of what's needed for those two propositions. On top of that, feeling one way or the other with the marijuana program as it was decided in 2018, we now have two of the four dispensaries and the dispensaries are supposed to earn between four and eight million in tax that goes into the city coffer. Uh, the general fund I think is going in the right direction. Uh, we definitely need to help out businesses. Part of it is affordable for business. It takes a long time to open a business and we need to streamline that process so that we can go ahead and open more businesses faster, which will put more revenue into the city and help us overall with running city operations day to day. Thanks, Patty. Now, get close to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I did attend the proposed 23-24 uh, budget meeting that was actually held here in the, in the library. And I also have, because I'm a budget person, um, I've started to review the actual proposed budget that's online. Um, one of the things that I did notice is that we are going to be increasing our expenditures because of our anticipated revenue. And we are going to be adding 30 some positions um, to the um, actual budget. So that tells me that we're, we're starting to come out of where we were. Um, we did have some issues with the budget back during the Great Recession, but we're starting to come out of, of that now. 
and also um, looking at the strategic plan. We are going to be looking at trying to develop some things in Western Chula Vista, and we're also going to be uh, looking at reinstating some of the services that were, that were lost during the pandemic with our libraries and with our parks and rec. Thanks. Uh, following up, is it acceptable that Chula Vista has had a deficit while promising a surplus for the last nine years? Steve? Well, it's never promising to have a deficit. I mean, no matter where you work, no matter where you live, uh, the deficit in spending, you know, there's a lot of programs on the line. There's retirement, as we know, uh, public safety. We have the, probably one of the best police and fire departments in the county, but public safety's budget is 72% of the monthly deal. So we have to make do with the rest. And the city, I think, is going to do that. They recently just paid back their deficit in the PERS retirement. Uh, the city was uh, eight years in the rears, hadn't made any payments at all. And under the PERS system, you can stay in PERS indefinitely and not make a payment. But they managed to come forth and they paid back their total amount, which puts us even, Stephen. There are 66 cities, by the way, in the state that don't pay any money into PERS but still have PERS retirement. So with that being said, I think our budget is going good and I think we're generating the money we need. We need to build better housing and we need to have more businesses like my small business. We need to help them, give them money and we need the federal government and the state to give pandemic relief after the pandemic like they gave our business in order for us to keep going during the crisis. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Jose, do you want to repeat it? Are you okay? Uh, oh, I heard the question. So. One of the striking things about um, focusing on something like the deficit that exists in the city and, and how uh, with administrative procedures and accounting gimmicks, you can create a surplus, you can create a, a deficit. But the bottom line is that I think the majority of what the residents in this community are not concerned about the very small working deficit that should be erased over time. We're concerned because we don't have enough housing for our community. We're concerned because uh, the price of housing has gone up 30%. And so I'm hoping to address uh, the deficit, certainly. But I think there are significant challenges facing West Chula Vista families. And I don't think they are centered in City Hall's budget. They're, they're centered on the policies and procedures that we're creating to foment economic growth, economic development, and build more housing. And I want to talk about those issues. I hope we get an opportunity to do so today. Great, thank you, Patty. Just repeat again. Oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, is it acceptable that Chula Vista has had a deficit while promising a surplus for the last? Okay, so as I kind of stated before, it is very challenging to get to a balanced budget. Um, I did that for, assisted with that and actually had to try to do that for the last 20 years with the county. So it, it is a balance. Um, I do think that there were times where the city had to cut services, libraries, park and rec, all those various things. And that's hard on the community, that's hard on the citizens. But where they were trying to go was to be able to retain some of the things that we needed to do. Uh, police, fire, some of the infrastructure, fixing the streets. Um, this, some of those core basic things had to be retained. Um, I believe in looking at the budget, the city is starting to, to come out of the deficit. They are starting to put money in reserves for future problems and future emergencies and issues that come up. Um, and I think we just need to keep going down that path. Uh, definitely, I believe in doing a five-year forecast. Thank you. Um, here's the next question. By the way, we need more questions. You guys got to start writing. If you need a card or something, raise your hand. Um, what is your main concern or improvement to District 2? And how will you implement it? We'll start with Pat. So my main concern actually is focused on two issues that I think uh, intersect, and that is our homeless situation and our affordable housing crisis. Um, as I mentioned, I did homeless outreach. I was actually a founding member of the uh, homeless outreach team in downtown San Diego. So I was out on the streets with the with the 
the people that are living on the streets, and there's really not an easy solution for that. Um, it, it's a very challenging situation. It's very unique to an individual as to what they need and when they're ready to um, accept services. And then if we do get them into services, the other issue is affordable housing. We do have affordable housing in Chula Vista, but most of that housing is still out of reach of most of the people that we would be trying to help, low income and very low income. Um, the p places that have um, affordability for low income and very low income have five plus wait years. So the two are interrelated. Thank you. Jose? Uh, I believe there's two priorities, three priorities that we need to address. The first one, we already do so as taxpayers in this community. We're working with Measure A and the income that we derive through Measure A to hire public safety officers. The problem is we can't hire enough of them fast enough because of the professional standards we require them to, and expect them to have. The second issue that I think needs to be addressed is how to support the, 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 growing, the growing houseless population that is, has impacted our community. And as we all drive around our neighborhoods, we see that there are multiple cars parked uh, starting in lawns, we see trailers or mobile homes parked in front of people's homes. We are confronting a housing crisis that we need to address. And lastly, we need economic development to increase job centers in this community. It is critical that we work on all three together to have the quality of life we all expect. Oh, I, I spoke over, I'm sorry. Just a little bit, huh? Let's see. You know, for District 2, <clears throat> District 2, I think, really has three, almost four priorities we can list all at once. Public safety, of course, we want to keep. We like living in Chula Vista because we're in a safe city. We have a good fire service. Now we have a new ambulance service. So we like to keep that going. We need to keep that funding stream. On the same hand, we also need to go ahead and support the small business community. The idea of streamlining the loans and going ahead and getting more small business, which in turn will generate revenue for our city. As a small business owner, I know it was important for us. We went quickly. We opened a business that was needed, but we need to see more of that and attract people to come down. And we need talented people. To get talented people, we need to have put an emphasis on education in our district. But not last to say it is homelessness. We need to address what homeless is doing. Chula Vista currently is putting together a small town in the South Park, but you know, we really need to come together. As a veteran, we have veterans stand down once a year. And we bring in veterans, we give them haircuts, we give them uh, talks and counseling, job service. We need to have a stand down, but for general homelessness here, twice a year where we can offer the services that they really need to have. And we could do that in our district. Okay, thanks. All right, here's the next question. And I'm gonna start with Jose. How will you ensure that Measure A money is used to hire only fire and police? Well, as you know, when the Measure A was adopted in June 2018 by the voters of Chula Vista, there was an expectation created uh, that th created with the passing of this legis legislation in the city that there would be a citizens review commission that would follow how investments are made, not just the Measure A funds, but the general fund funding that is dedicated to public safety. These goals are clear and they're understood by the community. And that's why we all know that we have an expectation to hire 41 more pu um, public safety officers, foreign officers. And um, we've done a really good job of hiring firemen, but uh, I, I think there's safeguards in place and there's a commitment by the elected representatives to honor the will of the voters in using Measure A funds. Maddie? So kind of what he was saying, the, the Measure A funds um, were an expectation of the voters that they would be used to hire police and fire. And the, the people who are elected currently, they know that. And they are, you know, in, as far as I, I know, they are monitoring that to make sure that that is what those funds are used for. And um, just have to kind of keep an eye on, on the budget and the line items and do what we can in order to hire um, more police and fire. 
Um, there is a, there is some um, expectation in the adopted, well, in the proposed budget where they will be adding some staff to the police department, and that is one of the things that they're actually putting in the budget for this for this um, upcoming budget. Steve, well, Measure A, Measure A is needed. It's uh, set up to hire police and fire. Now, fire hired all 30 of their positions in the first year. wasn't tr wasn't hard finding somebody that wanted to be a fireman. Police, on the other hand, they're still one short four years later of their projected goals. On that note, what we need is we needed the oversight committee. So now the bill is a no sunset bill. So, you know, that means when my grandchildren are my age, we're still paying that tax for police and fire. However, the oversight committee, which Measure P currently has, is due to expire in the end of this year. What we need is we need my first job. My first thought on the job is to go and extend the oversight committee to go no sunset as well. As you're well aware, Measure A has been rated twice. Uh, the Oversight Committee has stopped the rating both times. The city attorney tried to take money out of it for four positions, and then it was rated somewhere in the city government, which is kind of hushed up. But both times it got shot down. We need to protect that Measure A, everything. That's what we have it for, police and fire. Police are having a hard time hiring people, and they've said flat out that it's hard to be a policeman now. Four or five years ago, police... No, I thought we could finish the sentence. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, all right, here's the next question. Our city only has one code violation officer. If elected, where would you find the funds in the budget to hire another code violation officer? Uh, Steve, go ahead. Well, you know, the budget, there's only so many ways you can slice the pie, and eventually the pie gets so thin, you're really wondering whether you're eating pie or eating crust. Uh, the way to get that is, again, the marijuana businesses are supposed to bring in a total of four to eight million in revenue. Now, whether you're for or against marijuana, you know, the city's got it, just got to accept it. The point is that we get the revenue for it. Public, uh, you're talking, I've dealt with them before, they're hamstrung. Uh, several years ago, prior to 18, uh, we had a massive layoff. They took a layoff, the electricians took a layoff, the plumbers took a layoff, and the carpenters took a layoff. What I mean by that is the city currently has one electrician, one plumber, and one carpenter for all the city buildings, and it's been that way since 2016, and they have one code enforcement officer. We really need to add more across the board, but that especially because they affect when you have a problem with your neighbor, with junk on the yard, with a broken down car, loud noise, one guy, and he only works days, is hard pressed to get everything done. And we could find the fund through our tax revenue from those programs I talked about. Thanks, Patty. So again, I think um, what we need to do in this situation is kind of look at the budget and look at our priorities. Um, they are adding positions. I don't remember if there was any uh, positions for code enforcement, but like Steve said, there's only so, way, so many ways to slice the pie. And we need to, you know, look at what our priorities are. We did cut a lot of positions, and I know they are looking at adding some back. And we just need to make sure that we, we look at our funding, look at our revenue, do our projection as far as our five-year forecast of where we think our revenues are going to be coming in, how our tax revenues are coming in, and start plotting out what we're going to be able to build over the next five years. Thank you. Jose? So one of the opportunities we have as policymakers is to start thinking not within the box, but it, it beyond the box, outside the box, on top of the box. And why I say that is that public safety is more than sworn officers. And when you talk about a court enforcement that we only have one for a city of 270,000 residents and 52 square miles, I think we're not, we're not focused on the problem at hand we need code enforcement officials to contribute so that I, we don't have to send sworn officers to deal with issues that are created. And let me give you a clear example. Right now we have businesses that are uh, squatting on Third Avenue, impacting the, our public safety. They have, they've set up these little temporary businesses and they bring um, equipment that puts the community in danger now, if we send a public safety officer to address that, we're taking that public safety officer away from the community. We need to find ways to amplify what we mean by public safety and not trip over ourselves and without being able to do the right thing for our community. Thank you. All right, Patty, start with you. Chula Vista is hoping 
to build more housing? How will the needed resources be provided, like water, police, uh, fire, traffic? Where will funds come from? Ed. Okay, so I do know that in the budget right now, there are some federal funds that are going to be used to uh, work on the um, building some housing. And we need to look at how we can use the Measure P funding for building infrastructure and the critical infrastructure needs. Um, so I, I know I sound redundant saying we got to look at our budget and look at our priorities, but we really need to look and, and see what our funding can be used for. We also need to make sure we, we don't not work with our state and federal partners and even the county partners um, to see what we can do to leverage funds from, from not just our taxpayers, but from other funding sources. Steve? That's great ideas. Okay. We need to go ahead and apply for more federal and state grants. Grants are big. Grants are given out like candy practically during COVID. That's where we need to go with that. We have the revenue in there. I disagree with the Measure P. Measure P was set up as an infrastructure to fix uh, the retirement home, not retirement home, the senior centers, and also the gyms, the pools, the streets. Measure P, of course, only addresses the bottom quarter. All the streets were given a number rating, zero to 100. Measure P goes ahead and addresses one through 25. If you live on street 26, you're gonna have to wait more than 10 years because they stop at street 25. But that's how Measure P is set up. Problem is Measure P is gonna end in five more years and it's gonna be over. And unless we give it an extension or do a no sunset like they did Measure A, then we're gonna to have to find the money. The money can come from within the city. They do have the budget resources. It's a matter of allocating and deciding what is needed most in our city and what we can do without, or at least hold back a year or two and catch up from tax revenue of new businesses that we're gonna to attract to come to Chula Vista. Thank you, Jose. So in our, in our responsibilities uh, through state law and through regional planning, we need to add another 10,000 dwellings to this community. Most of that development is gonna happen on the east side. What we need on the west side is take advantage of the, specific, uh, the urban core specific plan that was developed 20 years ago and actually start building high rise and mid rise where it's planned for. And I'll give you an example. There's a property uh, that borders on the corner of Interstate 5 and East Street. That particular area is designed to go 200 feet or 20 stories. We can add housing in those spaces that are designed to have that kind of density and not impact the community. Now, I think this question gets to a bigger problem that takes more than a minute to respond to. But this goes back to the imbalance that we have between housing and businesses. We need to create a good balance so that we're like the city of San Marcos or the city of Carlsbad, who have a proper balance and can invest in the support resources to accommodate a growing community. Thank you, Jose. All right, next question is, will you continue to change commercial and industrial zoning to residential and deprive the city of jobs and tax income to please developers. Uh, Jose, go ahead. No, as I said, particularly in West Chula Vista where we have some of that uh, very limited, but we do have industrial development, industrial zones, we need to keep those. We need to balance how we're developing our community so that it can sustain itself. Now what is clear, and we are seeing it in our schools, by the way, our West Side schools are undersubscribed. What's happening, people are moving out, people are leaving, and so you have spaces at Hilltop Middle, at Chula Vista Middle, we have our elementary schools with, uh, where, that are not at capacity. So we do have room to grow as a community, but we cannot in any way uh, allow any of our industrial or business corridors to be rezoned for housing. We have the ability to increase housing. The Sears property is going to add about 256 for sale uh, spaces. We have about 680 uh, uh, dwellings planned. And I think there's an opportunity to work with developers who are, have these two-story buildings or single-story building and incentivize them to go high-rise. And you. we don't need to take uh, over industrial spaces. I'm so sorry. 
Hi. I apologize for going over my limit. It's all right. Steve. Really? <laughs> hey, so here's the deal. So I don't think we should go ahead and take away industrial area to put houses. I don't think we should take away a housing area and put industrial. I like the model that the East Lake and out in Otai have done. They build these five and six story apartment buildings and the bottom story has uh, infrastructure. It's got gyms, it's got markets, it's got banks, it's got credit unions, it's got hair parlors, everything. I've noticed that in Chula Vista on Broadway, there's been several centers now built that are about five or six stories tall and the bottom level is all businesses. I like that idea. I know the idea came out of gas lamp mainly because people didn't have to take their cars, they could walk to business. But the point is we could make business opportunities in those areas for businesses, yet the housing is above there. You'll notice that the parking lots behind Third Avenue are slowly turning into apartment buildings. Uh, we lost ours for Third Avenue Ale House. However, that is a good way of getting more housing by going up. I know we have a cap, but we can go up to five stories, but it'd be great to have businesses at the bottom and then housing up above. Thank you. Patty? I don't really know what to add to that. I'm kind of going to say these guys just need to you know, drop the mic. Um, we don't want to change the zoning for either the businesses, as Steve said, or for the housing. Um, I was going to talk about the areas over kind of like an Otai where they have, like he said, the businesses and then you have two, three stories worth of apartments. Um, that's a model I think that, that would be doable um, here in Chula Vista and it would increase um, small business opportunities as well as getting some more affordable housing, which we definitely need. All right, the next question is, how do you plan to address the homeless situation, specifically shelter in inclement weather? And we'll start with Steve. Homeless, hot topic, hot potato. So the deal with homeless, the city is going ahead and opened up an area. It's going to start in January of next year where they've got 60 teeny homes that they're putting together. Uh, they've got uh, 10 that'll fit four people and they've got, I believe it was 45 or 50 that'll hold uh, two people. And then along with that, they have trailers that'll have uh, uh, showers, they'll have a kitchen facility and two meeting areas for job centers. However, I think we, what we need to do is we need to come together. You know, we could think this to death until, and meanwhile, homeless keeps increasing and we're in the think tank. I think really that we need to bring all the groups together, not let them be outliers. They all get funding, they all get grants, uh, they all have loan money from the state. We all come together, kind of like I said, the veterans stand down. We do that once a year. We attract veterans from all over San Diego. It's a wonderful thing because vets are all brothers and sisters. Well, guess what? Homeless people are all uh, citizens and they've just struck a bad chord in their life for being homeless. And we need to bring together services and we need to do this on a, not a monthly basis, a bi-monthly, every six months. We need to have a big area where we can bring them together and give them the service they need to get back together in the community. Thank you. Uh, Jose. So addressing uh, homelessness, houselessness is a huge issue here in Chula Vista. And many of us think about the, our homeless community as those that we see in the parks or that we see in the river, in the river uh, sheds or the watersheds, like the river bottom in Otay, Otay River and Sweetwater River. What I want to bring your attention to is that we have other forms of homelessness and those are, and you can see them in the schools. When you visit an elementary school or a middle school, you'll start hearing about how they have to support families that um, are experiencing houselessness. So we need a more comprehensive policy and more permanent structures like the one that uh, um, Stephen is referring to. I think we need a regional approach. Uh, I don't see that we'll ever be able to catch up with the kinds of supports that are available in San Diego. But if National City, Imperial Beach, San Ysidro, if we work together, we can provide support. So supporting Homeless, the houses community from inclement weather. It's kind of not a huge challenge here in San Diego, um, but I think we can do better, and I think we need we need to figure out how to work together to address this challenge. Thank you, Patty. So I agree that we need to look at this as a regional issue. Um, there is a team that can go out um, and provide services who are in uh, for, to people who are in crisis with either mental health issues or alcohol and, and drug issues that's provided by the, the uh, County of San Diego. 
They have come to the city of Chula Vista and, and helped out probably about 45 people. Um, but I, I would challenge that a lot of people here in the city probably don't even know those services are available. When there's somebody in crisis, the they, first thing they do is, is call the police. Um, so we need to make sure that we have our uh, community know what resources are out there uh, other than just calling the police. In addition, I think we need to work with the county. They just um, allocated $10 million to cities that will sign an MOA with them that when they open a homeless shelter, the city will help provide services for mental health, public health, screenings for infectious diseases, that sort of thing. We need to look at stuff as a region. Okay, next question. What civic activities or in volunteer activities have you participated in, in Chula Vista, including uh, speaking at council meetings? Um, let's see, we'll start with uh, Patty. So, my jumping into politics is kind of a, a new thing for me. Um, as I said before, I was 34 years uh, working for the county. So, most of my activity was involved in the county level, not at the local level. Um, there I might have to present to various boards. Um, I used to have to uh, annually present to the, the mental health uh, advisory board and various other advisory boards. So my, my uh, experience is more at the county level uh, and now I'm, I'm trying to jump into the fray at the city level. Thank you. Okay, um, Jose? Thank you for the question. I've been involved in this community for the past 20 years. I participated in the development and, and um, growth of South Bay Forum, which is a community-based organization that focused on public policy issues in this community. And this is a space where we hosted a number of forums uh, in by dealing with public policy issues and candidate elections. I have also was co-founder of the Chula Vista Democratic Club in 2009, we've been hosting monthly meetings since 2009, and we were uh, impacted by the pandemic, obviously. We, we had to go virtual, but we had our civic home at Manja Italiano, and we met there monthly and hosted a number of community topics, uh, even though uh, we were a partisan organization. I'm also president and member of the board of directors of CA, C, SCA San Diego County, have done so for the last nine years, and that is a uh, nonprofit organization that enforces our civil right to access to fair housing. We have attorneys that we hire and uh, outreach professionals who share with the community about fair housing in Chula Vista and other communities. Thank you, Jose. You guys are great at extending sentences, but uh, where are we? Steve. I need to get a, a class on extending sentences. So uh, volunteer work um, in communities. So back, my time is limited on that. In the 80s, I spent four years with Chula Vista Elementary volunteering in special ed, mainly at Greg Rogers and Ann Daly as an aide. Uh, from there, I went on when my kids were in school, they were asking for parents that would come in in second grade and sit there and let kids read to you, which I encourage everybody to do. It is so much entertaining. And you just sit there and let them read and it's just wonderful. Modern times here, I haven't done much here in the city, I will admit that. I, my job in Cal Fire requires me to talk to residents from Hamul all the way to Acumba from Interstate 8 to the border. And I'm there to tell them how to cut back their bushes, what fire safe council programs are, free chipping, free brush clearing, uh, discounted tree dropping. That's where my expertise been for the last eight years. I think I do a wonderful job. I inspect about 4,100 houses a year and I'm in my eighth year, and I try to help the East County. As far as what Chula Vista has been doing, there's plenty of opportunity here, but my job's pretty much a full-time job in the East County, and my two days off, I pretty much take my boots off and I look out the window. Okay, next question. Do you think it's acceptable that fewer fire, police, library, administrators, animal control, human resources, IT, and public works positions are funded in this year's budget compared to 2006-7. And let's start with Jose. Uh, I don't know if there's the right or wrong answer to how we're dealing with our budget challenges. 
Of course, we just went through the pandemic and it, and it created some challenges. I serve as an elected official in the water industry and in the water industry, we're able to raise rates to meet the operational needs of our organization. And I don't think that would be appropriate for the city of Chula Vista. I think there have to be choices, priorities, and sometimes we're going to be understaffed. But I, have, I think we have good news moving forward as Patty has shared with you. The budget outlook is good, the economy is coming back. And one of the things that is going to grow in this community is the hospitality industry. And we benefit greatly from the hospitality industry because from people who pay their, their room charges every day, we get to keep uh, 10 cents on, or 14 cents on that dollar versus a half a cent or one cent from a sales tax sale. And I think that's going to be a change maker for this community. And I, and I hear there's pot in this community. Um, so <laughs> okay. hopefully we'll be collecting those taxes too. Um, stay safe, Chula Vista. Thank you, Patty. So as I stated before, um, number one, it's a balance. Got to look at your expenditures and revenue. Uh, from what I'm seeing, we are showing increases in our revenue that's coming into the city. Um, I, I would anticipate some of that is due to um, some of the sales tax that we now get from sales of things online, uh, which uh, can kind of be a, a little bit of a boost to your revenue. And from what I'm seeing, we are adding back some of the essential positions that, that we uh, lost during the pandemic and also all the way back to the Great Recession. So I do think that we're, we're starting to move forward. I think we do need to uh, look at helping our small businesses because they're probably the ones who are gonna be able to help us um, bring in some more revenue and we just have to kind of keep that balance. Um, you know, I pretty much have the answer I want. Can you read the question again? Because I just am not any good at that extended <laughs> sentence thing. This is an extended question. Do you think it's acceptable that fewer fire, police, library, administrators, animal control, and human resources, IT, and public works positions are funded in this year's budget compared to 2006 and 7? Okay, so uh, in 2006 and 7, we did go through a lot of layoff. We, that started with Mayor Cox. You remember when she came on board, the first thing they said is she should file bankruptcy for the city of Chula Vista. That we were so far down the rabbit hole, we wouldn't climb back out. She said, nope, not on my watch. She turned around and laid off a, a dozen or more police officers, a dozen or more firemen, and found them jobs everywhere. Not one of them didn't have a job by the end of the layoff. As far as what that goes, I know that uh, there's been some talk of going into Measure A and Measure P and using funds for that, for those positions, for clerical, for overhead staff, for IT positions. But you gotta remember, those two, those two propositions were set up for one special reason. Prop P was infrastructure and pavement highways. A was for hiring police and fire. It wasn't to buy more beds, more tables, more computers. The budget is doing better because now we're getting more infrastructure and plus again we have give or take about a 29 or 30 million dollar reserve budget in the city and we're right now required to have a 12 or 13 million so we do have slightly over and that's helping our current budget different than it was in 06 when we didn't have a p or any of the other measures we have thank you patty sure what you got out of the last one yeah uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. We went in order. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what would you do to improve the appearance of the North Broadway business corridor? And go ahead, Patty. Oh, okay. So that, that's a hard question. Um, so I think what we, we need to do is kind of um, look at well, first of all, I think we need to get input from the community because um, I think different people from different groups have different ideas on what they think should be, um, what that corridor should be looking like and what businesses should be there and what uses it, it should have. So I think we need to look at that and then we, I think we have to look at what is available under, uh, under Measure P to um, see what we can do to Im improve the look of that area. Okay, 
um, Steve? You know, that came up in 2018, and I know uh, right away they put in a bicycle path down the side of Broadway, mm -hmm. and they went in and reduced it to one lane of travel going southbound. Uh, that made a lot of sense at the time. However, you talk to the residents, the business owners, not really, but they are. You talk to the residents and business owners, and they're like, uh, you took away a whole lane of traffic for our customers and put a bicycle lane that rarely anybody rides a bicycle down. Mm -hmm. So how did that help us? I think ideally we really need to, Broadway's been around since, since I was a kid. I can remember Broadway in 64 is a whole different Broadway than what it is now. But the point is, we really need to talk to the business owners and the people that live along the Broadway corridor two or three blocks in, just like around the Third Avenue corridor that we have now, and find out what they would like to do with Broadway. There is a way to fix Broadway up. Are you gonna fix it up enough to where it's gonna be a designation for uh, resorts and for uh, vacations? No, probably not. But you at least could fix it up so it looks pretty. New businesses come in, maybe different facade, maybe offer some grants just to build up the outside of your building to make it look a newer, fresher look. It's like a new coat of paint on your house. Thank you. Jose? So one of the challenges we have here in Chula Vista is that we haven't harmonized all of our aspirations with the policies we actually have. And so one of the problems that I, I believe we can address immediately is when a business owner wants to improve their property, we have to figure out how to make sure they're compliant with city codes and let them do what they want to invest in. There, there's currently businesses on Broadway that it takes six months, a year, two years to get the proper permits to be able to make improvements. So that's one area that I think we need to improve. A second area is we do need to talk to our, the community and tell them that we're gonna have a 1500 room hotel and, and supporting infrastructure that's gonna attract different kinds of folks. And so the properties that are along Broadway are perfectly suited to support the existing community and visiting community. And if they take advantage of this opportunity, they're going to be able to, to leverage and bring their businesses up. And I think everybody's interested in making money or, mm -hmm. and having a good quality of life. All right, next question. How important is creating bike lanes on, on our streets, given that most of us are not going to ride? We are too old and get out, of, too old to get out of our cars, and there appears to be few bike lanes. And then we'll start with Steve. You know, bike lanes, I ride a bike too, but uh, I ride off-road, because really, I'm got a deathly fear of cars and cars seem to be attracted to bikes like magnets. So with bike lanes, I know when they put the bike lane down uh, Broadway, it was mainly because they were gonna attract the resort that was going in at the foot of J Street. However, the Port Commission decided to put their foot in the middle of that and they held on for almost 22 months and they finally signed the paperwork yesterday. So right now we're 21 months behind the 2018 projection of that big arena and the hotel. Well, you're right, I rarely see a bicycle ever going down uh, Broadway, because guess what, cars go awfully fast, and if you've been hit by a car once, trust me, if you're still alive, you're probably not gonna ride a bike after that. What I do think, though, is that we could have bike, put a bike lane in J Street, taking us from the marina up to Third Avenue. They already proposed a trolley system for that in 2018. Once the marina is built, we could have put a bike lane there, and I'm sure people would bike up to Third Avenue, park, use the shops, get back on their bike, and ride back down to the hotel on the coast. Uh, Patty. So I think what we need to do is kind of right now kind of put a moratorium on, on building any more bike lanes and kind of uh, what Steve was saying, once, once the Bayfront is developed, then look and see what, what are we going to need to help with that uh, project. Um, the one on, on Broadway, I drive on that frequently. I have never seen a bicycle on it. So I think we need to kind of just do a pause and then look and see you know, what other changes we've been making in improving different areas and then decide what we're going to need. Jose? I tend to agree with my colleagues in one regard. I, I don't know that bike lanes are specifically today the highest priority in West Chula Vista to address. There are other issues that require our attention. I will, I, I will acknowledge that bike lanes, particularly the one on Broadway, is part of a system of transportation that is being planned regionally. And so these connectivities and this infrastructure that's on Broadway is not just 
for the residents on Broadway, but it's intended to connect National City and to connect in South, in South Bay, the other communities in the South Bay. So I think we need to do both. I think we need to start planning creatively and address these innovations that are coming for the, the users, but we are only gonna get more bikes used when we create the densities that support having a store right close to your, your home and maybe your job right close to your home. And um, that'll motivate different modes of transportation, but it cannot be done uh, all at once. And um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think the stop sign is waving at me. We're, we're training him. All right. Housing is important, but on commercial streets, should you vote multifamily to replace commercial or make mixed projects? And let's start with you, Jose. So uh, we have an urban core specific plan for West Chula Vista. We need to start following it. And what that means is that all of the areas and all of the streets has all been planned out to meet our housing goals. And we have areas where we have this kind of development already planned. And the, the having mixed development where you have business on the first floor and housing, that's not innovative. Uh, what I mean to say is that's already happening in a lot of communities. What we cannot do, however, is take any of our commercial spaces and transform them into housing. We have spaces allocated for housing. They will be mixed use, but we need to create the densities in the appropriate spaces, like at the Sears building, that is an appropriate space to create uh, high density, high rise, also, the, the, the location that's next to East, East Street and the 5, where the trolley passes right by and the freeway's right there, that is the kind of planning that we need to do. Thank you. You know, you go down Broadway and you're heading uh, south on Broadway. You know, we used to pass the O'Shakey's Pizza. It's been gone forever. So you get between uh, J and K Street on the right, and they built an apartment building there that's uh, six stories tall, and the bottom story is all businesses. Now, they got that idea because we were doing that in East Chula Vista already. Now, there's always a difference between 805. There's West Chula Vista and East Chula Vista. West Chula Vista always says the funds are going to East. East says, well, of course they're going here. We have the better houses. So the idea is that we want to go ahead and use the commercial area. I like the Sears parking lot. We want to use that. It could be commercially, we could mix it up commercially and housing wise, but I really like the model that worked on an India street. It's worked at gas lamp. It's worked elsewhere. We do apartment buildings that are no more than five or six stories tall. We go ahead and put a infrastructure in the bottom and people, I mean, honestly, I would love to just walk to the market and walk back to my house, but it's a 10 minute drive over to Terra Nova, but I'd much rather have a market at the bottom of my floor of bonds. I could just walk and shop and go back upstairs. Thank you, Patty. Okay, just one, one more time, so I get it in my head. Oh, read the question. Housing is important, but on commercial streets, should you vote multifamily to replace commercial or have mixed projects? Okay, so I, I kind of like the idea of um, mixed projects. Um, my mom moved out here a few years ago. She moved over to the Otay Ranch area and it is to a, a senior community, uh, senior um, low income senior um, apartments. And it is so great. The people who live in the, the two, three layers can just go downstairs. There's a little market, there's a pizza place, there's a taco place. Um, it, it really works well, particularly if you're looking for a low, un, uh, low income housing which is what we need to help out our, our uh, citizens that are low income. So I would, I would take a look at the Sears building. Can that be a mixed use? Maybe. Um, I think we also need to look at our housing plan that we have. A lot of things changed with the pandemic. Funding streams are changing. We have different things going on. I think we should get input from the community and look to see is, uh, is there something different that we should be doing or keep it the way it is. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question is about ADUs or granny flats. What's your opinion of them and the decision that was made about them? Uh, let's start with Steve. I'm 100% behind ADUs. ADUs are the sign of the future. 
On my street, a neighbor down the street, this was about six years ago, had an ADU in his garage, but back then the city was anti-ADU. City came to his house one day from a, we, in my business we call it neighbor narc. So anyhow, so one of the neighbors narked out the fact he had ADU in his backyard. The city showed up, took one look at it and said, shut that all done and put the garage door back on. And there it went. But now the city's doing it because we have such a homeless problem. ADUs are great, especially if you either have a large piece of property, large being quarter acre or more, and you want to put another, they have teeny homes, they have so many different ADUs, it's unbelievable. Or you can convert your garage. With the way the, the way the housing is here now in the South Bay and in our district, ADUs make perfect sense and I'm all for it. What we have to do though is we have to speed up the project. We have, still have to have the, the, the fees, but we need to speed up the project. It cannot take nine months or a year to build an ADU. Nobody's gonna wait around that long and spend that much money just to put an extra one bedroom on their apartment. Thank you. Okay. Yes, accessory dwellings are uh, so one of the solutions. There's state law that has created opportunities um, to streamline the approval process and to lessen fees. I think as accessory dwellings can be harmful though and so all, particularly if you have large lots, obviously they're perfect, but it has come to pass now that we can subdivide our lots into three or four, create multiple units, and I'm concerned about the parking, uh, the parking situations that are going to develop. I know there are some really good developers out there that are thinking outside the box, that are creating good projects, and that are um, really creating an opportunity for the homeowner to have a second string of income and develop a, a, an accessory dwelling that um, will serve a, a, a somebody who can't pay as much rent. And so I think it is a good solution. We just need to be careful that we don't um, overextend this community with too many of these particular units. Patty. So I'll say I basically agree with the colleagues. Um, I think we need to have a ADUs. This kind of uh, made me think back to when I first moved to Chula Vista in the 80s. I was, I was very low income at that point and I couldn't afford an apartment and I ended up living in a, a converted porch on somebody's house. Uh, and, and part of my rent was uh, to take care of the, the trees in the backyard and pick the fruit. So I, I understand kind of what it's like to be on that, that side. Um, so I definitely think we need to have some ADUs, but I also think, um, as Jose said, we need to look at, at a balance of how many do we put on a property and, and how is it going to impact the community and not uh, look at it a little more holistically. Okay, next question. How would you communicate on a regular basis with the residents of District 2? We'll start with uh, Patty. Well, I'd like to think that I've already started to do that to a certain degree. Um, when I was walking around to get uh, signatures to actually make it onto the ballot, one of the things I, I did was I told people kind of what I was looking at uh, for the city of Chula Vista, but I was also, and I had a, I had a notebook, my trusty notebook I carry around, uh, I was writing down their ideas, and it was so great to be walking around and having people bring up ideas that I may not have thought about uh, like speeding traffic by, by hilltop and different things like that. So I would continue to try to have some kind of a forum, uh, either in writing or with a website or actually having local community meetings where um, I could interact with, with the people in the neighborhoods and get input, particularly areas where people may not feel they have a say in what's going on. Okay. So all of us probably have experienced the use of next door, and this is, uh, to use Stephen's word, this is the narc society, and this is where um, we all share maybe concerns that are happening. I think we need to find a way as elected officials to extend and create better spaces for the community to be engaged. And if you're speaking about West Chula Vista, I think you also need to acknowledge that a great majority of the residents that live with us may not always speak English or have access to information in their language. As such, I think the city's already starting to turn around and address this important need. 
um, but civic spaces like these, uh, one of the things that I hope to do, should I have the, 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 should I be honored with the support of the voters, is I wanna move my office out of City Hall. I wanna be I either here in the library or in another space so that I have closer access to the residents and they can approach it without going to the palace over at City Hall, which I call the palace, by the way. Steve. So we addressed this uh, four years ago, and four years ago it sounded good that we would have coffee hutches. You'd find key people that you've met in your campaign that live in different parts of the city, people that are, like to organize their neighbors just to have talk and find out things, and we would have these once a month. You'd split up the district into five, seven, eight different areas, and you'd schedule a coffee deal where you just come and have coffee and talk about your neighborhood and what's going on. Along with that, I'd like to go ahead and have something, something similar to what uh, Rudy did, where once a month he would have a publicized form, something like this in a library or something, where city residents could come and you could voice your concerns. You've got to realize that as a city councilman, I'm on the board, we decide policies, we decide ordinances, we vote on things, but we can only vote on things that the city gives us. You, the people, are really my employer. And you need to be able to tell me when something is wrong, when you need something fixed, when you just don't like the fact that your street is narrow at one end and wide at the other. And that is what I need to hear so I can do something on the council for you. Thank you. All right. Another question. What specifically would you do to make building faster and less expensive? Who's going to be the magic person? Jose. Well, I think I'm getting all the hard questions first. <laughs> so there are three things that we can do immediately to start improving uh, um, how builders, how developers are, are getting their projects done. And so one of the challenges that they have is that they come in, request a permit, request a permit, get their plans reviewed, and that there's no certainty in time. I think we need to specify when we will complete a review process. If a, a developer brings in all of their materials, we should be able to turn around that in 30 or 60 days. Right now it can take two, three years to develop a large project. It could take a whole year to develop a small project. That's unacceptable. Second thing, I think we need to make sure that we have um, a, what I call a trusted developer program, just like we have trusted traveler program to cross the border. I like to work with uh, developers that are proven to meet regulations, to meet safety standards, and when they bring a project, streamline the review so that they can get their projects done faster. Those are two ways with the amount of time I was given to um, streamline development and save costs. All right, uh, Patty. So I agree that the uh, permitting process needs to be looked at because it, it, it's, I've heard from uh, folks that even just to make an improvement to your house, uh, it, it can be a, a long process to get everything done. Um, and, and one of the other things since we have touched on um, affordable housing, that is kind of a whole different process. When someone goes to, a developer goes to build uh, regular housing, they go to the bank, they get a loan, they buy the land, and they, they pass those costs on to the residents. But when you're looking at building more affordable um, housing, you're going to be looking at dealing with the city, the state, the feds, and that also is going to add a lot of time to the process. So we have to look to see how we can streamline the process um, if we're working on uh, trying to get more affordable housing because working with those government entities just adds time to the whole thing. Steve? So uh, as you know, four years ago I ran for city council and I met with a lot of developers on the east side where we were talking about problems they had. And one of the questions we had then was how much housing cost and why does it cost so much? And they made it quite clear that from the time they actually pull a permit, from the time they actually purchase the property, pull the permit, get done, the average is one and a half to two years before the shovel even hits the dirt. Meanwhile, every month they're paying on that property. And guess what? Developers don't work for free. So they add that cost onto the price of the house, and when you buy it, you're paying for the two years that it took the city and the county to process the forms. 
Now, my feeling is that that takes way too long. We opened our business on Third Avenue. They wanted it. The city wanted it. It was a perfect win-win. We got. We started in. We started in March of 15, and by July, we were opening the doors. Permit, building, everything done in four months for a commercial building. Guess what? That could be done everywhere if there was just a priority put on doing it, and that is the problem. We still pay the fees, but we just speed up the process and get it going faster. Okay, thank you. Steve, starting with you. Please explain your beliefs in how the city can work with neighboring educational institutions to establish a stronger middle class and jobs with salaries that align with the cost of living salaries. Well, you know, uh, my parents always keyed in on me that education is key. Uh, I know that going through uh, elementary and high school, I got fairly good grades. I wasn't a good student, I'll be honest with you. I thought I was going to join the Army when I graduated. But then I got to 12th grade and realized I didn't want to join the Army. So I went ahead and went to Southwestern College. I was a marginal student. I finally got into, into the Air Force, got back out, got into law enforcement. Um, the whole deal is education. Education is premium. Parents, teachers, mentors, grandparents have to stress education for their kids. You know, you have a four-year degree. It doesn't guarantee you're going to get a good job, but it doesn't guarantee you're going to get a worse job than you didn't have the four-year degree. So we need to really push education, and that will in turn build up the workers that we have coming in, which will get more qualified workers into Chula Vista where we can keep them here and not send them to San Diego or El Cajon or import our workers from Murrieta or El Centro because they can't afford to live in Chula Vista. So they make the hour and a half commute in some place more affordable. We want to keep them here in Chula Vista. Thank you, Ted. So um, I also think education is very important, something I stress to my teenage daughter. Um, and I think we need to bring a um, university to Chula Vista, I think that's important. But I think what we also need to look at is other programs, not just four-year college. What is going on with, uh, say, Southwestern College and how we can partner with them? I know we need to kind of look at maybe having some programs here where we have students that work with the city, like, like student workers, that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't think we really have something like that developed here in the city. Number one, it gives them the opportunity to get experience. Number two, it, it gets them into civic engagement. Um, they, may, they may find that there's some other career path that they didn't even think of that um, might come out of their working with, with the city and doing different either mentorship programs or things like that. Thank you, Jose. So I think the premise of the question is really challenging, particularly for the realities of right now. So, and I say it in this way, I think of a middle class family as a family that can afford to buy a home, a family that can take care of their kids, uh, is able to support them to pursue activities, et cetera, et cetera. And let's think of what's happening right now. So I, I think that there is a real big challenge unless we start rethinking about how to urbanize this community and about the opportunities that we need to make available. Now, as a 24-year as a veteran of university and college opportunity, I know the value of education. And I work every year. We are graduating 10,000 students this weekend out of San Diego State. So I have that background and experience. But I'll tell you that no college degree is going to prepare you to be able to buy a $750,000 home as soon as you come out. And so we have larger questions that we need to deal with in this community. We need to start addressing these challenges. And um, so I appreciate the question, but I think the premise is this place right now. Okay. Um, what can we do to improve traffic in the Chula Vista Mall, especially the empty Sears building? Patty. Um, well, I think traffic, other than just Chula Vista Mall, um, we're, we're having a lot of issues. I, I live closer over to the hilltop area, and I know routinely that we, we have uh, people speeding, we have crashes. There was one on, on the hilltop while students were walking to school. Um, it, it's, we have to find a way of having 
number one, more patrols, and number two, I think we need to have a way or more an easier way for citizens to be able to report what, what they see um, on some sort of a forum. Is that a website? Is that you know sending a text message um, that we would have to look at? Uh, Steve. Well, so right off the bat, so for those of you that lived here prior to 1990, Fifth Avenue used to go all the way through. Then somebody had the wise idea that we had a shopping center right next to Sears and block off Fifth Avenue. So now you have to like make a left and go up to Fourth Avenue, but then make a right and go back down to Fifth, or you got to go down to Broadway. The whole idea is that that put a big old stone right in the middle of Chula Vista going from north to south. Now that Sears is gone, I think we ought to reopen Fifth Avenue. There's no reason we couldn't do it. Along with that, with the new fire station on Moss. Now you go up Moss the third, and you're going east, and right away you see a sign that says road ends in 1.2 miles. Now if you're diddly dallying around, you don't pay attention to that, you dead end into the brand new fire station have to do a U-turn and go back two blocks to cut over. We really need to open up streets that go straight through. I'm not knocking the new fire station, I'm just saying that we need streets to go straight through. Also, traffic circles are a big deal. I know there's been a lot of accidents in my time on Hilltop and on L Street. We talked years ago about putting in three traffic circles between 805 and 3rd Avenue. Now, traffic circles work good in Carlsbad, Encinitas, Del Mar. They work up and down the coast, but they don't really seem to be too much popular here other than way down in industrial. There's one traffic uh, circle near the trolley station. Traffic circles slow down traffic. All right, uh, Jose. Can you ask the question again? I think uh, I missed the nuance there. What can we do to improve traffic in the Chula Vista Mall, especially the empty Sears building? <laughs> what a curious question. So one of the opportunities that we have, um, and if we watch what's happening in other parts of San Diego, that they're, uh, they are locating um, businesses, employment centers, in these kinds of spaces. Horton Plaza is transitioning from a mall to a business and employment center. Seaport Village is trying to attract a significant amount of employment centers there, the biotech industries. So what are we gonna do with the Chula Vista Shopping Center? I think it needs to become an entertainment area. I think it also needs to become an employment center and a housing center. I think you address traffic by locating your job, your housing, and your entertainment in the, the immediate vicinity, and that is how we're going to start addressing traffic. I think the, the era of, um, uh, given all of the planning that's going on regionally about trying to get us to use public transportation, bicycling, reduce car trips, is possible, and then of course telecommuting needs to be in the mix for certain industries. I think I was able to work from home for 17 months and do my job well. I think we need to bring those kinds of innovations into our community. All right. Should council pass an ordinance requiring 365 days notice to seniors or disabled tenants before the owner can take rental off the market? Uh, let's start with Jose. So uh, one of the things that I think the city of Chula Vista needs to do is follow state law. State law provides a lot of provisions already that create protections. I don't know that the city of Chula Vista needs to increase or decrease the amount of regulation that already exists that is created by state law. Now let me say that I think uh, senior citizens and disabled our disabled community needs to have, when we need to pay special attention, particularly with fixed incomes, and these economies that we're living where rent is skyrocketing. But I think if we're following the implementation of the Tenant Protection Act, that seniors and disabled community members can reasonably expect uh, that the rents are gonna be stabilized with that law, and that uh, eviction notices will come with uh, only if it's truly a property is coming off the market, or the other elements that are prohibited under the legislation. Steve? I think that the, um, I'm using up my time thinking about what Jose just said. I'm, uh, I personally think that for senior citizens, I happen to have one in my family, my mother, she's 87. Uh, she'll be 88 this year, but I'm not supposed to say that, so wait till August, I'll tell you it again. 
Uh, so my mom is 87. Um, she owns her own house, but if she was in a rental, I know that she wouldn't be able to pick up and move quickly. The state does have protections already in place. I don't really see the need for the city to supersede the state or we have to intercede with the state. So what, the state goes first and the city has longer ones, we refer to the city. Um, I do think that senior citizens and the handicapped should be protected where they live. You should be able to just go in, give them a 30 day eviction notice and have the marshal show up and say, see ya. We need to have plan and you need to be able to help them find a new place as well. They shouldn't just say, hey, it's up to you. Cause if you look around, there's not a lot of rentals in town. And they're all over the place. They're not necessarily in your neighborhood. They might be five miles away in the middle of Sahara, Chula Vista, in the middle of nowhere, Chula Vista. You really need to help them find a new place if you are going to be asking them to leave. But they need protection to stay there. Patty? So again, I basically agree with uh, what was said. Um, I think we do need to uh, follow the state law. I don't think we need to impose um, anything further than, than the, the state, what the state has as far as protections. But I do, um, I do agree with Steve that we do need to kind of keep an eye on what's happening with our, our seniors, particularly those who may be in the low income um, housing market that we have. Um, as he said, it wouldn't be easy for them just to pick up and, and move and finding an affordable place would truly be a challenge. So we need to look and see if there's something we could do to add a, a little extra layer of protection for our seniors and disabled. Okay, this is gonna be our last question. How will you attract new businesses to come to Chula Vista into so many empty buildings on Broadway and 3rd? And Steve, go ahead. Wow tax incentives right off the bat. And then we're gonna help them move in. Uh, we're gonna help with infrastructure. Uh, we're gonna speed up the building process like I told earlier. Uh, we'll still have the same uh, fee system going on because fees generate money for the city. But on the flip side, we're not gonna drag it out to nine, 12 months. We want a business. If you wanna open up a business, you should be able to open a business. You shouldn't be working down at, um, you shouldn't be working for the government and you're trying to open a business for 15 months and you're going through the fee process. If you want to open that business, you should open it up in six months. Hell, you should open it up in four months and it should be a process going. We can attract people if we lower the time limit to open a new business with the fee schedule going, but we lower that time. And then we also have a university on the east side and we get educated people that also want to open their own business and they want to stay in Chula Vista and not fly off to another community with their tax dollars in hand. Jose? So one of the things that's gonna start changing in this community is the mix of, of, um, of residents, the mix of uh, individuals who locate in West Chula Vista. So if you start attracting businesses to Third Avenue and Broadway, you need to be able to communicate what these new demographics are. In addition, we have a $1.5 million development that's gonna open in about three years and businesses who are interested in making money from these developments need to start finding their way and locating on Third Avenue or Broadway and our other business corridors. I think another very important element that needs to be um, addressed is that uh, as the pandemic begins to go into endemic stage, the, we have an, an extraordinary number of individuals who visit us from Baja, California, and they are part of the business milieu in this community. And as such, they, if they are attracted and come to businesses that are serving them, they will increase the purchasing and, and, and profitability of, communi of this community. Thank you, Patty. So I um, agree with Steve that we need to look at the fee process and see what we can do to decrease the time that it would be for um, individuals to start businesses. I think we also need to look at the, the Bayfront development and what we're gonna be able to do to use that to attract other businesses. And again, looking at, at having a university here, there are gonna be people that are gonna wanna um, stay. The other thing that I think that we really need to do is we have certain resources here. We have the Living Coast Discovery Center. We have the, um, the Olympic Training Center. And I think that we need to utilize those to show off Chula Vista. 
Um, I know we tried to plan an event at the Living Coast, and there were people in Chula Vista that said they didn't even know that the Living Coast existed. So I think we need to look at our resources that we have here, and we can use that to help people say, yeah, you know, maybe I want to have a business in Chula Vista. It's a cool place to be. Okay, thank you all very much. This has been a lot of questions to go through, um, but it's also very revealing uh, to get your opinions on all these different topics. Um, I want to also thank our timekeeper, Vicki Riggs. Uh, she had to keep her nose on the watch all this time. Um, and our uh, co-sponsors, the Crossroads 2 and the Southwest Chula Vista Civic Association. So uh, please remember that the uh, statements made here are not uh, are not reflective of the sponsoring organizations. Uh, we're going to start with closing remarks. The candidates have two minutes for each, and we're going to go in reverse order, so we'll start with Jose. I want to thank you very much for all of you who are able to join us today and listen to this first of hopefully many uh, debates that will follow where we'll get to exchange our priorities and our values for the city of Chula Vista moving forward. Uh, I, have, I, I have three priorities uh, that I will follow and that we'll stay committed to. I, I believe we can increase affordable housing ownership and rental opportunities by building the densities that are planned. Uh, that's high rise and mid rise in the specific areas. I think we need to make sure we hire all of the public safety officers that we were committed to with Measure A. And I, I think we need to work collaboratively with the regional areas that are gonna help us employ all of those individuals to make our, our community safe. And thirdly, we need to create public structures that are going to support families that are in transition. And families can include elderly and disabled, uh, families include families with children and young adults who are graduating and are trying to decide if they're going to stay in this community or leave to find more economical opportunities. I've been involved for the last 20 years in this community. I've had the opportunity to be engaged in a lot of civic topics that have come up in the questions you've asked today. Uh, I have been uh, a professional at a university for 24 years. I'm very comfortable working with individuals from different perspectives with this different expertise and contribute to solutions. Uh, I also have been an elected representative, your elected representative um, with the Sweetwater Authority that offers safe, reliable drinking water to all of you. And lastly, I've been engaged civically uh, and I believe that I have the perfect combination of experience and activities uh, in, in my resume that will help me be an effective representative, representative for you. I, I hope I can count on your vote. I would be honored to represent you in the city of Chula Vista District too. Thank, thank you, Jose. Patty? Well, thank you for allowing me to speak here at the forum. I'll just do a quick rundown of, uh, if, you, if you look at my um, ballot statement, police and fire, homeless services, affordable housing, services for seniors and disabled, and making sure that we bring back um, the parks, the library, all those types of services that we lost a lot of during the pandemic so that we can help out our families, especially families with children that, that didn't have those resources available to them. Um, I've, I've worked for government, but I haven't like served in this capacity. But one of the things that um, my friends always tell me is that I, I talk with such a passion um, towards the city and I've actually had friends that I've told them about the street fairs and the fun things to do in Chula Vista and I've actually had friends who moved to Chula Vista because they said I moved here because you, you talked about it and it's such a great place so I am, I am now that I'm retired I'd like to be able to use all the skills that I've developed at the county um, particularly I get into budget and strategic planning and analysis and um, I've had many opportunities to go into departments and kind of do a 360. Look at, the, look at what's going on, what they're currently doing, what maybe we could change, what other people are doing, uh, and, and look at what would be best for the community. 
getting community input. And I'd like to be able to use that skill of being kind of impartial, kind of logical, um, to, to move forward uh, some of the projects that are going on in Chula Vista. We have a bright future. We're coming out of the pandemic, and I'd like to be a part of it. So thank you. Last but not least, uh, Northwood Chula Vista deserves a city council representative who actually has had boots on the ground. I've served and protected this country and community for 44 years now, and I've proved I'm a proven leader in that positive change. As a side note, just to let you know, the Measure A funds, uh, Chula Vista has hired eight lateral police officers, and they've got 12 more going through the academy. If those academy guys can all graduate and finish their first year of probation, then that'll eliminate 20 of those 40 positions that we're currently short of. Along with that, I want to say that uh, please don't vote for anybody just because they're in an elected position now and they say that I've been in an elected position, so I'll be with you, especially if they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s. Me, I'm 66 years old. Thank God I have good health. I don't plan on going to hire councils as far as I want to go in my life, and I want to do the best I can. Along with that, if you're going to hire somebody for council, make sure that they support the no mileage tax, okay? That's a new one coming up because Chula Vista has two sandbag votes and council can decide yes or no on the mileage and either kill it or afford it. So you wanna make sure that your council people are against it so that we can kill that mileage tax, unless you're just looking forward to paying $600 a year average per car for the rest of your life. With that in mind, I wanna thank the moderator. Great questions from the audience. I really like them, they were a little challenging. Thank you for coming out today and seeing us and I look forward to hopefully seeing you next year next year, later this year, after the primary. And with that, thank you. All right, good luck to all our candidates. Thank you, audience. Great questions.